Good morning. Uh, first, let me open with um, a quip uh, by the uh, late uh, Nobel laureate in economics, uh, Paul Samuelson. And in the 1960s, uh, Paul Samuelson noted that the stock market has predicted nine of the past five recessions. So just keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, our, our theme today is, is the economy is downshifting uh, to much slower growth than what we've been used to this year. And, and for those of you who are, are not used to a stick shift and you downshift, sometimes it gets a little rocky in the car and sometimes it could stall out a little bit. So that's sort of the, the theme. And we've had a forecast for about a year right now that the economy is on a 3-2-1 growth path. And by 3-2-1, I mean 3% growth this year, 2% in 19, and 1% in 2020. So the 3% part has worked. So, so far we're one out of three. So far the, our forecast for 2018, which was made a year ago with this time, talked about 3% growth this year, that's come in. And, and the thing is we're now thinking we're gonna downshift to 2% and then the risk is, is 1% in, in 2020. We're in an environment where inflation and wages are rising. Uh, we think the unemployment rate will go to around 3.5%. And that may not be all that heroic because we were last at 3.7%. We'll get data on Friday. It's conceivable it will be there Friday. Uh, the Fed, we think the Fed continues to normalize interest rates. And I'll talk a little bit what normal means because there's a, there's a range uh, that uh, Chairman Powell talked about. We're normalized, and we're also doing this in a, in a rapidly rising uh, deficit environment. Uh, we think uh, uh, financial volatility is rising. And what I want to caution is, is that the last three uh, recessions were either triggered or exacerbated by problems in the finance sector. The 1990 recession was triggered or exacerbated by a big crisis in commercial mortgages with soaring defaults, largely around office buildings and shopping centers. The recession in 2000 came from the dot-com crash of 2000 and 2001, uh, over-exuberance in the stock market. And the 2008-2009 uh, Great Recession came from uh, big problems in the mortgage market. Uh, this time we're going to say the problem is in the corporate credit market and in, in the corporate bond market is where the risk in the system is. It's not in, in single-family mortgages uh, uh, and, uh, it's not in, and it's probably not in, in, in commercial mortgages. And the other thing is, is the trade war with uh, China is morphing into something much bigger. It's far more than a, a trade war. It could very well be the beginning of a long-term economic cold war with China, which means that the tensions we have now will be with us for several, for several years to come. All right, this is our, our growth forecast. And, and you could notice that here was our 4% second quarter, three and a half, third quarter, we're two six for the fourth quarter, gradually trail off and we go down to about seven tenths of a percent, really, really slow in the uh, second half of 2020. So, so that's the three, then we go two, and then we go one, and that's on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter basis. All right. Next is, is employment growth is also slowing in this kind of environment, we're running out of people. And instead of getting 190,000 to 200,000 jobs a month, we're going to be downshifting to call it 150,000 jobs a month next year, and about 40,000 in 2020. And we could have negative, we could have actually a, a, a couple of quarters or a couple of months of actually declining job growth at the, end of, at the end of 2020. So industries that rely on more and more jobs are going to have some real problems uh, starting in the second half of uh, next year. And we have the unemployment rate continuing to drop to 3.5%, and we have it at 3.5% all next year, and then we have it gradually going up as the economy, as the economy slows in, 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 in 2020, it goes up to 4%. Now, 4% is what we used to think is full employment. Right now, we may be at over full employment. <laughs> and this is some debate around that, but most people think the full employment is four, between four and four and a quarter in the United States. All right, we have the Fed normalizing policy. That all of a sudden is being called into question given what's happened in the stock market and what's happened in, in, in the bond market. <clears throat> the definition of normal for federal funds rate is as follows, is, is in, uh, prior to the financial crisis, uh, we used to think that a normal funds rate was 2% two, two above the rate of inflation. 
So if uh, we have a 2% inflation roughly and we have 2% above, a normal funds rate would be 4%. Right now it's two to two and a quarter. That was the pre-crisis. Most people don't believe it's not 2% anymore. At the height of the financial crisis and immediately thereafter, people like Bill Gross at PIMCO and, and other folks were saying that the normal funds rate should be, should be uh, at, the, at the rate of inflation, no premium to the rate of inflation. So therefore, the normal funds rate is at 2%, and we're there. All right. Uh, most people right now, including most of the Federal Reserve, thinks the normal funds rate is 1% above the rate of inflation. So if the rate of inflation is 2, normal would be 3. If you look at the dot plots that the Fed releases every quarter of where the members of the Federal Open Market Committee consider normal, the range is between 2.5 and, and 3.5, and mostly centered between 2 and 3 quarters and 3 and a quarter. So our sense is that's why we have the funds rate going up to three. Now, the path, when we did this, we had three or four rate hikes next year. Other people, at, and then Powell spoke, and some people said they won't be as aggressive. But I take a look at the forecast of Goldman Sachs, and you'll hear from that from David later, David Costin, and you listen to what J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley is saying, Wall Street, is still, Wall Street economists, whether right or wrong, the market disagrees with them, uh, a Wall Street economist is still saying we're going to get three or four rate hikes next year. That's what we have penciled in, but I wouldn't take that to the bank given how, how the markets have been reacting uh, uh, lately. But nor, just remember where normal is, is, is we may, if normal is two and a half, we're almost there, it's one more rate hike. If you think normal is three, the Fed's on track to going to three, going to three percent. Okay. I, the other thing going on is, is we're beginning to see increases in wages, and we're seeing 3%, and we think we could go to 4%. And there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence out there. There's just an uh, increasing shortage of labor. Year over year, the average hourly wages is up, are up 3% right now. This total compensation, this counts the health benefits and vacations and, and, and other employee uh, benefits. So we think we could get up to to 4%, and that's part of the inflation pressure we see is inflation coming in the service sector, not so much in the goods sector. Okay, here's our inflation call. Well, we have inflation over 2% by headline and core inflation for the forecast period. Now, when we did this, it was done before the big, huge drop in the price of oil. So the thing is, if oil stays at around 50 bucks, what have you, you could probably take a quarter to a half a point off of core inflation, for at least in the beginning of this period. But we, have, we think the normalized price for oil is in the 60s for West Texas and maybe the high 60s for Brent. Uh, I talked to my oil, I have a couple of oil gurus. I, had, I talked to one two nights ago, had drinks here in, in town. And they're still, and he, this guru told me is, is when oil was in the 70s and everybody's saying it was going to 90, he said, no, David, the normalized price is in the 60s. So I met with him on, on Monday when oil was 50. What's going on? He said, no, normalized price is in the 60s, somewhere in, 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 the, in, the, uh, low, in, the, in the low 60s. So that's sort of where we're, we're, we're assuming it's going to end up. So if it ends up somewhere in the 60s, the inflation forecast we have here is probably going to be pretty good. If it stays in the 50s or goes lower, it's going to be too high. Okay. The other thing going on with, with interest rates, which will affect the long end of the bond market, is the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet. The Fed is selling bonds on the order of 40 to $50 billion a month. Now, when I did this chart a few months ago, you hardly could see the drop. But now it's obvious you could see the drop. So every day, the Fed is in the market selling bonds. Day after day after day after day, about $40 billion a month. You also have the other seller, and the other seller is called is the federal government. And the federal deficit, the federal deficit is running a trillion dollars next year. So that's about 80 to 90 billion dollars a month of supply coming from the federal government. So you take the Fed at 40 to 50 and the, and, and, and the federal government at 80 to 90, you got 130 to 140 billion dollars of new bonds, net new issuance, hitting the bond market day after day, month after month after month after month. And that will put upward pressure on rates. And the other thing you see is, is, is no one cares about the deficit right now. And here we have the deficit going by the end of the period to a trillion eight a year, and this is sort of baked in the cake. And, and Congress may not be interested, to paraphrase Leon Trotsky, of, of all people, to paraphrase is, is, is Congress may not be interested in the deficit, 
but pretty soon the deficit may be interested in Congress. And, 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 the bond may, and also the bond market may be also very interested in, 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 in the deficit. So whether that's next year, the year after, or 2024, I, I don't know. But this is continuing ongoing pressure every single month. The, feds, the federal government is in the market selling bonds and selling bonds and selling bonds. And we're going to find out what the appetite it will be for all of those, all of those bonds. All right, here's, this is the stock market. And I, got, I updated the chart so it's plotted through yesterday. And you can see at the very far end of the chart, this big vertical drop. Uh, and this is the S&P uh, uh, 500. Uh, and, and the market, what, and we'll ask David Costin, the, 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 is, is, will say about this, but the market seems to be reflecting worries about a growth slowdown. But the thing is, is, is our forecast for growth for 2% next year and 1% in 2020. We're more bearish in 2020 than most of Wall Street. But most of the Wall Street forecasts, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, have this growth slow down to somewhere in the twos next year. So it shouldn't be a surprise to the stock market about the growth slowdown. So maybe it has to do with the Fed raising rates too much, or maybe it has to do with trade tensions with China. And one of the triggers yesterday was when Trump said he liked tariffs. You know, he came across the nice G20 meeting. Everybody thought it was a big success. And then he said, he, said, he did a tweet, I'm a, I'm a, tariff, I'm a big tariff guy. <laughs> that, that's what he said. And all of a sudden, the, the, he opened the trap door in the market, and, and the market dropped. If we go to these 25% tariffs it, sometime in, in 2019, is, is our forecast is going to be too optimistic if we go that way, because there are no winners in a trade war. All right, the other thing that's happened, in the, it isn't only the stock market. It's also the bond market. And what you see at the very end is, is we've had, for the, after a very long benign period of very low credit spreads, and this is the junk bond to treasury spread. All right, so these are below investment grade bonds. And it used to be 300 over the 10-year treasury. So if the 10-year treasury was three, a junk bond would be six. Now 10-year treasury three, a junk bond is seven. So even though treasury rates have gone down, the yields on junk bonds have gone up. That means there's worry about stress in the corporate system. Now, uh, some of it is idiosyncratic. Part of it is the drop in the price of oils affected all the less than investment grade oil and gas companies that are worried about repaying their debts. Part of it is the big problems of General Electric. General Electric's investment grade, it may not be investment grade for long because that company is, is totally and, and royally messed up. And then finally, there's a very local issue, is, are the bonds of PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric. If they're required to pay for the fire damages, their bonds, which are now investment grade, will go to junk rating. So all of a sudden, you have a lot more below investment grade bonds, and the yields are going to go up. So some of it is, has to do with issue, concern, generic concerns, and some of it is very idiosyn, idiosyncratic. And this is what Yellen said about another part of the bond market. Leverage loans, which banks make, and we'll have a panelist, we're going to ask our, one of our bankers on the panel. Huge deterioration, that's her words, in, in the 1.3 trillion leverage loan market. So Yellen is worried about it. Chairman Powell talked about it also in a speech a couple of weeks ago. So that's a, a big issue. So my, my big worry, if there's an excess in the system, it's on the corporate credit side, because most of the merger deals that have taken place in the past two years have been financed with uh, debt. AT&T borrowed $190 billion for DirecTV and Time Warner. And AT&T, a year from now, might be also looking at below investment grade rating. This used to be AAA 100 years ago. All right, now, it has to do with China. Uh, Mike Pence gave a speech on October 8th. And, and it's more than trade, the issues, he says. America had hoped that economic liberalization would bring China into greater partnership with us and the world. Instead, China has chosen economic aggression, all right, which has in turn emboldened its growing military. And then he also said, and this is relevant for UCLA, Beijing provides funding to universities, think tanks, and scholars with the understanding that they will avoid ideas that the Communist Party finds dangerous or offensive. China ex exper experts know that their visas will be delayed or denied if their research contradicts Beijing's talking points. And this was in Pence's speech in early October. 
So the issues with China are more than trade, they're broader geopolitical. So even if we get a short-term settlement with trade, this, this issue continues. And to add an additional emphasis to this, this is the words of former Treasury Secretary uh, Hank Paulson. He was a chairman of Goldman. He used to commute from New York to China while he was chairman of Goldman. He was the key China contact at Goldman. And as Secretary of Treasury, he fostered uh, a very positive relations between the US and China. And this is what he said, an economic iron curtain. When I read that, I fell off my chair reading that in the Wall Street Journal for Paulson saying it. If William said that, it would be no big deal. But, if, <laughs> but, but, but if Henry Paulson said that, that's a big deal. And that may soon descend between the two parties the result of which would be, quote, a long winter in U.S.-China relations. His words, systematic risk of monumental proportions. This is Henry Paulson talking. So the question of trade it, it is a small part of the geopolitical relationships. So it's much more than trade, so this is not going to go away for the next, for the next uh, several years. All right, and, and the thing is, reflecting all this, the Chinese, yeah, our stock market, we think our stock market is bad. Well, China's stock market is down 30%. Because they're feeling the brunt of it ahead of, ahead of us because it's affecting uh, their exports to the United States and, and uh, other countries. So their stock market has been weaker, weaker than our stock market. So they're feeling pain on the other side of the Pacific a, as well. All right. Now, the, the thing is, is, with all the talk about trade, trade deficit keeps going up. And, the, and Ed will talk about that a little bit later. But the thing is, is, is when you produce... When you consume more than you produce, you've got to import stuff because there's not enough savings in the United States. So if we don't import from China, we'll import from Bangladesh or Vietnam or someplace else. So the trade deficit is this year, call it in round numbers, 900 billion in real terms. Next year, a trillion. And the year after that, a trillion one. And those are sort of mirroring the federal deficit. That, that, what, that's what I'm talking about. So the thing is we continue to suck in, we continue to, to, to suck in imports because we have this imbalance between what we produce and, and uh, what we consume. All right, now in terms of the domestic economy, consumption peaked in the uh, second quarter. It's gradually trailing off. It's still positive. Uh, housing activity has just been the biggest disappointment in this whole cycle. We have it modestly going up, but, it, but if you could call it flat, if you look at, at the chart, is, is it just housing is just in a rut. It can't seem to get out of its way. And there's a little anecdotally, um, uh, two days ago, Toll Brothers, who, which is a, a major producer of high-end houses around the country with a very, very big presence in, in California, noticed that, that, that home sales fell off a cliff in November here in California, and they're at the high end of the new construction. Uh, in the new construction market, you know, the seven figures and, and, and up in, in, suburban, in suburban areas. So housing looks, well, looks like it will stay sluggish. We may be too optimistic on housing right here. It may be down instead of uh, flat. All right. In the big boom in the, in the economy, we get 12% growth rate numbers, 8% growth rates, is what the Department of Commerce calls intellectual property. What is that? That is computer software stuff going to the cloud. It's research and development spending. And it's also uh, intellectual content coming from film, and entertainment, and TV shows. You see it all over Los Angeles right now with all of a sudden the new super studios are not Warner Brothers and, 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 and Paramount and, 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 and Warner. It, it is uh, Netflix. It's Amazon. It's Hulu. They're taking all the space. So that, so that business is, is booming, but we have that gradually slowing. It'll still be growing faster than the U.S., but we don't see an era of 8-plus percent growth rates for, quote, intellectual uh, uh, property. And part of the reason why NASDAQ may be weak right now has to do with there may be some slowdown in, in, in software related to the cloud. Still growing fast, but not as fast as it was. All right, then the other thing in the economy to see why we have a slowdown in 2020 is this is on the spending side of the budget. This is defense spending. So if you want to say what made the economy really grow fast in 2018, it's intellectual property, software in Hollywood, okay? And then defense, where defense all of a sudden is 3 plus percent this year, 4 plus percent next year. But in 2020, it's going to flatten out, call it zero. 
No, no it, it, it's a high level, but defense spending is going to stop growing in, 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 in 2020. So that's part of the slowdown is the fiscal stimulus is waning from the tax cuts. That will be through the system. And, and the fiscal stimulus coming from increased spending, both defense and, and, and non-defense, that will also slow down by 2020. So the big drivers of growth, intellectual property, government spending, and taxes, all those effects are going to wane. So you go from a 3% down to a, a 1%. That's, that's sort of the story. So to conclude, we still think we're on 321. We have the unemployment rate dropping. We have the Fed continuing to normalize policy. We think uh, what we're seeing in the financial markets, the volatility will continue, so get, get used to it. So volatility can be an opportunity, so you shouldn't run from it. You may, may want to embrace it. Uh, China trade war risks a, a new Cold War. And the other thing, USMCA, that's the new NAFTA, US-Mexico-Canada Trade Treaty. Trump is bringing that to Congress. The new Democratic House doesn't like it. So whether that gets approved or not is an open question right now. Whether it would have been approved anyway in, in, with, with the Republican Congress is not clear, but that's going to have a very tough fight, and that's going to take it's going to move China off the front page for a while, and we're going to start worrying about whether or not this whole Mexico, Canada, the U.S. supply chain could get messed up if this treaty gets uh, turned down by, uh, by, the, uh, by the Congress. And 2018 may look, 2019 may look a lot like 2018, where Main Street may do better than Wall Street, in a sense, because the economy, Main Street had, 2018 was a very good year. And the growing risks in 2020 is what we worry about, and we worry about the risk of a financial accident. So even though we don't think, the stock market may think we're heading for a recession in 2019, we don't think so, but 2020 is, a, is certainly a, uh, is certainly the risk of a recession. Now, let me just close. What the stock market seemed to be saying with the recent volatility is they, they don't think it's 321. They think it may be 310 or something, something like, that, like, like that, where things may ha be happening sooner uh, rather than later. So with that, I'll, I'll close, and, and thank you. Thank you.